right, welcome to Thursdays. It is True and Trivia Talk with Matt and you McGinty. and me, McGinty. Hey, 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 we are so glad for you guys to join us. We have it's a new year, 2022. It's 2022, man, it's here. It is not 2020, the sequel. <laughs> no, no, it is a new year with some possibilities. I'm really excited for what God's going to do at our church and do in our lives and doing this podcast. It's going to be awesome. So It'll today, we are going to do a new segment. It's a new year. We're going to try a new segment. It's going to be called Life Skills. Random life Skills. Random Life Skills. A friend of mine, Chris Willis, got me this awesome book for my uh, seminary graduation, and it's it's super awesome. It's just full of like solid gold, all kinds of great life skills. So we're going to do that new segment today. Also, Matt has a New Year's resolution, like family feud style, right? Yeah, kind of a survey says we're going to see if McGinty can guess what the top resolutions, top broken resolutions, and the top Christian resolutions are. Yeah, uh, my hopes are not high. Mine aren't either. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad you have low expectations for that. You're a true friend. Yeah. Uh, And then we're going to close out a a really solid time where Matt and Wes are going to talk through what it means to have a Christian or actually a biblical worldview. Mm -hmm. And man, Wes is going to bring some solid content on this, and it'll really be challenging to you to really ask yourself, do I honestly live my life out thinking through how Christ wants me to think through? Or do I have some, if I absorb some lies uh, from the world for these different other worldviews that are not supported by Scripture that affect my decisions on my everyday, actual, practical living. Yep. Um, and I think most of us, if we're being honest, it, it's going to be really, really challenging. So yeah. uh, stay tuned for that. It is a fantastic, fantastic segment. All right. Well, Matt, um, first of all, man, do you guys have a good Christmas? Yeah. Yeah. But have, have we done one of these since Christmas? I no, we have not. not. We did have not uh, done one since Christmas. Yeah, I guess the last one we did was the whole Christmas, uh, yeah, the whole Christmas episode. So For sure. It's been uh, a while. Yeah, yeah, it has been a it's while. All, it's but... pretty much been an entire month. <laughs> it has been an entire month. And somehow but... we still remember how to do this. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a good Christmas, a good New Year's, and uh, let's... Let's talk, let's talk about yours. You got you got a new little friend. We have uh, a new little friend. Yes, we we did the puppy thing. Now we did not do a Christmas <laughs> puppy thing. We adopted this little puppy uh, like four days before Christmas, and um, yes, hashtag totes adorbs. Okay, this thing is like half poodle, half. Did you really just say that? I did. I oh. say it ironically, okay, because Come I'm an on, old dude. guy you're, and I can't you're really 40. see. You're forty. That's the mo- that's why it's funny. Okay, I don't. I... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so okay. Uh, so share the name. Share the name of your puppy. I have tried my best. Just for the record, I've tried my best. This could be like a hashtag dad fail, all right? I've tried my best to get my kids to give this dog a true dog name, all right? Like a name that is like for real. <laughs> this is on the record, and this is like a solid, you know, two syllables or one syllable, you know, Rex or you, you know, or... But... I really want to call it Kitty, but, you know... <laughs> um, Cause it's a little, it's a little, and it's not, it's it, not going to get much bigger. It's about eight pounds. It might get up to fifteen pounds once it's fully yeah. grown. Yeah. It's not small. It's not big. So, uh, but the kids have decided this dog's name forevermore will be Fluffernutter. 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 Yeah. yeah. And it's a very fitting name. She's very fluffy, and she's very nutty, and <laughs> and that's what stuck. So, yeah, yes. And it, apparently, very uh, cuddly because uh, <sighs> every time I've seen McGinty with the dog. It's uh oh yes, it's a little princess. What the princess? What's up, princess? Yeah, I probably <laughs> talk more baby talk to this dog than I have to my He's four so children. Cute. So cute. Yeah. Thank you, Maddie. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's um, it is this this dog is does like to be cuddled. Uh huh. And yep. yeah, and you're happy to indulge. Him. I'm happy to indulge, man. It's it's <laughs> it's irresistible. But it's for the kids. The puppy. The, the dogs. The, the puppies for the kids. It's funny. Not Brooke was like really fed up with the dog at one point because she likes to. Uh, launched torpedoes on our carpet, and um, she's like, got had it, and you know, Holly wouldn't clean it up because it's supposed to be like her dog. And she's like, let's get rid of the dog. I'm like, no, don't get rid of the dog. Like, <laughs> no, we need to keep the dog. Like, it's it's a part of me now. It's, it's part for, of the family. It's for the kids. It's for the kids and me and me. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's crazy how quickly they really kind of sneak into your heart. That's for sure. I'm just a dog guy, man. I love dogs. Uh, and this is that's a, totes adorbs, Daniel. Totes <laughs> yeah. adorbs. We adopted this dog too. It's a rescue animal. Someone left this puppy and her little brother in a box on the side of the road. Wow, it's crazy. And this dog, this kind of breed. It's half cho- – it's like cheapu. It's normally – like you have to pay like $1,000 for one of these dogs. Hmm. So we got it for free. ka Okay. Hey, not to brag or anything. All right. So um, good times. And did yeah. you, you guys survive the, the war zone for New Year's Eve? 
the war. Oh, you mean just all the fireworks? fireworks. Yeah, we were a part of the war zone. That's like, right. Uh, your neighbors. We went out and joined up with them, and uh, yeah, yeah, we good times. We had some neighbors um, opening the door at you know twelve thirty, kind of looking like, "Are you guys? Are you gonna be done anytime soon?" Um, but yeah, we had fun. It was good. Cool. Well, we did like an outdoor movie. Watched Encanto, I think, for the fifth time. And uh, watched out to our movie with the fireworks all going off around us. It was cool. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get to it, man. We, uh, we're we going to do our new life skills segment. Give it to us, man. And what you first got? time. So the way this is going to work, I have this book here, Life Skills. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to flip through it. And when Matt says stop, I'm going to stop. And I'm going to read you this life skill. Okay. All right. So random life skills. This is full of all kinds of crazy stuff. The caption here is how to chop wood, avoid a lightning strike, and everything else your parents should have taught you. Okay. So. All right, you ready? I'm ready. All right, here we go. I'm closing my eyes. I'm going to flip it through here. Stop. All what right. What you got? I have here how to change gear. You ready for this? And it's got a picture of a car and uh, how to change gears. You ready? There's all kinds of cool diagrams. I'll just read you the, the, the summary here. Gears, what are they? You used to, you're used to driving an automatic car. That may well be your attitude, but not or cars that drive themselves. <laughs> you're like a Tesla. But not all cars are automatic, and particularly if you're driving in Europe, you may find yourself having to change gears in the old-fashioned way. The good news is that it's not as difficult as it sounds. In fact, you might find yourself enjoying the human-machine symbiosis so much you won't want to go back to your pig-headed automatic. And so it has all these different gears, and it's like, first gear is used for moving off, maneuvering, and negotiating hazards. Oh, good to know, right? Good to know. Third gear, I'm skipping second gear just for fun, is used to gain speed and going uphill and negotiating hazards at speed. It can also be used to give better control going down steep hills and going around the bends. I'm not going to read any more of this because it gets into the weeds, but this book is fantastic. So uh, that is your life skill for today. What are the gears in the car used for? This one's not quite as practical as other ones in here, but we got all kinds. How to sew on a button as instructions. How to make a cold frame. How to pour wine. Well, that's not one that we needed to really worry about. How to (laughs) roast beef. Hey, meat. How to make bread. All kinds of goodies in here. That's good, man. uh, So let me ask you, did you ever learn how to drive stick? Yeah. 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 Was that what you learned on, or did you learn how to drive automatic first? Uh, I learned how to drive automatic first, and then um, uh, there, I served for a year in Hawaii as a missionary. And we, the car, only car that we had was a uh, stick shift, and it was. You know, if you've been to Hawaii, you know it's, Hawaii it's very all kinds of hills, very mountainous and hilly, and so uh, yeah, it's I, only that, a volcano. That was that was one of the that was that was very difficult to learn because um, I, I was just so nervous. I would back into a car. And, oh yeah, yeah. So, so. like you come to a stop on a hill. Yeah. And like, okay, how much gas I'm going to give this right. thing trying to transition with right. the clutch. So I'm just, I'm so thankful that I did not have to drive one of those anymore. Yeah. yeah. My, my, uh, my dad was insistent that I learn how to drive stick before I learn how to drive automatic. <laughs> so our first little, my first car learner was a 1995 Ford Windstar. No, no, sorry. That was my van. I got, I gifted years later, Ford Escort. It was like the cheapest. It was, it was great. Um, but I could not figure out how to do the clutch and the gas. Like it just, it kept stalling out. It was like, because in my mind, the way my dad was instructing was, it's either or. It's clutch or gas. Like, you have to switch real quick. Yeah. And I was like, it just kept dying. I can't do that fast. Finally, he said, look at my feet. I'm looking at his feet and go, oh, you have them both at the same time. Like, you ease into it. Like, you, right. there's like this, like, wiggle room and in-between stuff. And then it was like, okay, I got this. And, uh, yeah, good times. It's not easy. No, it's not easy. But it's, it's an art form, man. <laughs> and it's so much fun to get to drive stick until you're stuck in traffic on I-35. Then you go, I regret this. Yeah, not so fun. Give me not the so Tesla. Fun. Let it, let yeah, it drive right? itself. Okay. Well, let's talk about New Year's, man. Let's talk about some resolutions. Resolutions. Ready? Yeah, let's, let's do it. See, let's see if you – how well you do in this. So what we did uh, – well, I say we – I didn't do it. But 100 people were pulled about – um, resolutions, and we're going to look at the top resolutions, top broken resolutions, and top Christian resolutions. So we're going to start with the top New Year's resolutions. And so okay. I've got eight on here, Daniel. And so um, I'm going to give you three guesses, and if you uh, try to your your goal is to try and guess one of these eight. Okay, and I'll tell you if if you're right and how high that ranks. So, okay. all right. New Year's resolutions. You're not cheating, are you? I'm not cheating. I can't. Okay. I can't read your handwriting anymore. All right. So. All right. So, <laughs> top resolutions. Give me three guesses as to what the top resolutions are. 
Is this just everybody or is everybody. this Christian? No, is this, this is this is everybody. All right, mm-hmm. I would say the top one is for the obvious of working out again or gym membership. Yep, that's the second one actually. That's the second one. Okay, yeah, that's good though. First one, eat healthier. That's the first one. All right, so eat healthier, yeah. exercise. All right, so what are the New Year's resolutions? Okay, um, is there something about job change or something in there? Um, a career career change or career consideration? Well, there's no. Nothing? Honestly, there's not. There's not? Okay, that's a no. fail. It's one. It's a one strike. <laughs> <laughs> Try and get some more. We need the sound effects bar. Here. Yeah. We're, gonna, we're working on that. Yeah. Um, other New Year's resolutions. I'm trying to think of different things that people might try and do. Uh, something involving relationships. Yeah. Like making friendships. Sure. Or make me friends. That's make one me of friends. Them. Okay. Yeah. Good. So you got you got three. I got three. That's so I'll give, you, I'll give you all of them here. Okay. You ready? Bring it. Eat better is the first one. Okay. Work out more is the second. Spend less money. Spend less money. So it's, I right? didn't get to the financial yeah. stuff. <laughs> Take better care of yourself. Okay. I feel like that's so general, though. Yeah. I mean, once um, you're eating better and exercising better, you're, you're kind of covered. Self, self-care. Self-care. I guess. Mm. All right. Read more. Uh, learn a new skill. Make oh. new friends, which is what you shared. Okay. Or a new hobby. New hobby. Take on a new hobby. I love how that's such a, like, a res- I, I am resoluting to... Spend my time doing something <laughs> that's, you know, I don't know. Some hobbies are really productive. I, I get yeah. that. But yeah. yeah. All right. So now. I resolve uh, to have more fun doing the things I don't normally do. Yeah. So the most broken resolutions. We know we're not always great at keeping resolutions. So nope. uh, a survey of 100 people. Um, what did most people say were the most broken resolutions? I think the most broken ones are going to be the top ones, right? So I would say the most broken resolution is to work out more. Huh? That lasts, you know, a couple months or something. That was the top one. Okay. Um, and then the next one would be the eat better. Uh, yeah, it was, but I'm trying to think, see on here how it's worded. Um, quit bad habits. Quit bad habits. Well, okay. diet. Diet is one of them. Okay, okay, so diet. Okay. Um, But the bad habits one, like if someone's like, I'm going to quit smoking or something, you know, yeah. that might be is yeah. it on there. It is, but I just gave that to you. Yeah, so. thank you. All right. So give me, give me, specific, give me one more. Um, the most broken resolutions, man, uh, to be nicer to people. <laughs> 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 to, to not get on Facebook uh, to post something ridiculous. Is that really a resolution of yours? No. Oh, no, not mine. Oh, okay. No, okay. Ridic- you know, okay. What it should be for people. All right. Um, so, yeah, you said exercise. The second one was get quit bad habits. Mm. Third was learn something new. Okay. Um, fourth one was diet. Uh, the fifth most broken resolution was to volunteer more. Okay. Okay. Um, so people have a lot of good intentions. I will right. help out people right. more. <laughs> eh, I'm going to do my hobby instead. Spend more time the with hobby's family. hobby's not on there. So notice that. Like. Yeah, if the broken resolution to pursue your hobby is not on that list. <laughs> he found a way to. Yeah. So the one thing that people are doing in the new year, they are making sure to pursue that new hobby. <laughs> they got that one covered. All right, well done. Uh, spend more time with family America. is a broken resolution, and then okay. uh, travel is the most broken, and mm. then um, getting out of debt. A lot of people start saying, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend less and get out of debt," and then they get into more debt. Yeah, then so. the the new iPhone comes out January 30th <laughs> right. or something. You know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> Can't I resist. can't do it. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. So last one. Let's look at Christian resolutions. What okay. are the top? Uh, well, what are three of the top eight Christian three resolutions? Top, yeah, it's hard for me not to be cynical on this, and um, they because they could go really general at the same time, right? Mm-hmm. But I'll try to think in terms of Christian culture and whatnot. I, I would say a big one would be to serve in the church more. Okay. Yep, that's one of them. Um, to give more to the church, maybe. Yep, that's one of them. Um, let's see, to to bring my kids is that on there? Uh, <laughs> invite to invite someone to church, maybe. Yeah, that's a, that. Definitely is one of them. Okay, yeah, you got three. Okay. I got three. Hey, look Good at job. that. Good job. All right. So <laughs> the top one is to study the Bible more. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, second one is to pray more. Third one is to evangelize more. Invite invite people yeah. to church. Um, Still counts as one. Yeah. I mean, even though those are, you know, two, two separate things. Yeah. Um, but uh, serve in church more, um, go to church more, live more godly. That's kind of a broad, broad, right? And yeah. then uh, to tithe more. 
Oh, and then there's another one, um, to sin less. To sin less. I will. <laughs> it's like, this year I'm going to resolve to sin don't less. Don't think about crashing into the pole. Don't think about crashing into the pole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or don't think about driving down the wrong side of the road in a new weird intersection. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> For those who are familiar with Pflugerville, this is such a tangent, but yeah. maybe you can make a New Year's resolution to pay attention to road signs <laughs> and, and weird intersections. Okay. So what he's referring to is the uh, if you live in Pflugerville, um, 685 and Pecan, there is a uh, – it's been closed for like what, a year? Just Eight, pretty much. That's yeah, been, 10 months. And so they finally open it up and I'm I'm all excited. I'm, I'm coming – uh, towards Pecan, and I try to turn right on Pecan, and I turn. And fortunately, this is at night, and I'm like, I realize that there's, it's marked um, to turn, wrong. For them to turn left, and then there's a car coming. I'm like, what, what, what's going on here? Why is and a so, car on the wrong side of the so road? So I throw it in reverse, and uh, I'm like, what is happening here? And then I look at the sign, and then I follow the sign. But I, it, yeah, I mean, I've lived here 11 years. Just the natural thing is, I'm going to turn right on red. Yeah. Nope. Don't, don't it's turn right all your red. natural instincts in the intersection need to be thrown out to the trash because it's it's at those intersections with that that third middle lane where you two directions of traffic use the same lane right. where you cross over on the wrong side of the road to make a left and it's it's so confusing. So I I mean I shared this story with my friend here hoping to you know get a little sympathy. <laughs> no none. Um, he goes on and on about how brilliant it is and so I go on I go online and find out that. Most of Pflugerville agrees with me yeah, and not you, much. but uh, that's all right. It, here's the thing. It's working really well to keep traffic down for two reasons. One, it's brilliant. Two, everyone's avoiding it. Yeah, everyone's <laughs> avoiding it. That's the you deal. Yeah. So I don't know if it's that it's brilliant or if everyone's just like, I don't know what to do or I don't want to. Because <laughs> every time I go through the intersection, someone is always going down the wrong lane. Yeah. like, And it was funny. Brooke went down that the intersection the other day. And she did it all correctly, and the person that went down the wrong lane just sort of like put their head over their face. Yeah. It's like just <laughs> the drive of shame. Yeah, right. <laughs> so this year, so if you have you, a New Year's resolution, drive. So they had safer. to decide: do I do I back up and get out, or do I just push on through? Like, what do you do? Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's just you got to just push on through. And I think everyone's like, okay, we need to at least reserve this one lane for the guy that's going to go down the wrong way so yeah. we avoid him. Well, and it helped now that they put the barrels there to and They've repainted some of it, too. Instead of like a yeah. dotted line, it's a solid line. They put some orange on the little concrete medium. I still think it's ridiculous, but uh, you think it's brilliant. I think it's ridiculous. I, but. I just recognize that someone had to think of this. Someone had to come up with this idea that involves an extra set of lights on either side. and all. It's so convoluted. It took someone brilliant to come up with it, but it's incredibly efficient if you follow it. Yeah, but it is it's dangerous. <laughs> if everyone else follows it. Yeah, if everyone else. That's kind yeah. of contingent on that. But all right. Maybe that's being too generous. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all I got, man. Well, that's let's – it's time, it's time to kick you out of here and – Kick uh, me out. And bring Wes in. In my place will be our senior pastor, Wes Wilkinson, and he's going to do a great interview with Matt. Not really an interview, but just a great dialogue about worldviews. So stick around. You will learn something. Absolutely. Guaranteed. See you in a minute. Adios. Hey, we are back, and Pastor Wes is here with us, and um, we are going to talk today about biblical worldview, developing a biblical worldview. And uh, Pastor Wes, you you started a series last night on this, and yep. uh, it was uh, it was good, a lot of information. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, we, I, I, man, didn't even go over half of what I had down in the notes, but <laughs> that is is what it is. Well, that's that's what you have next week yeah, and the yeah. next week and the next week. So. Let's um for those maybe that that uh, weren't there or even if you if you were there, um let's let's kind of do a recap. Um, worldview. What what are we talking about here when when you say a, a, a worldview? Yeah. So you know, worldview is uh, it's amazing how uh, ignorant we we tend to be. I think as church folk with this term, uh, I was first introduced to it when I was in high school. So I guess ah. I... Something you know, 15, 15, 16 years ago, and the, the term is real specific because it's not. We're not talking about world religions. I think we all know what world religions are. It's all, all you know, various different religions. There's mm-hmm. Christianity, there's Judaism, there's Islam, there's Hinduism. Buddha, everybody gets that. They may not know what each of those religions teach, but they get what a religion is. Worldview is not equal with 
religion. Now, there are some religions that are complete worldviews, mm-hmm. but not all religions are worldviews. In fact, some religions are subcategories of a broader worldview. So what do we mean by worldview? Real simple, uh, the West definition is um, we're talking about the the beliefs that a person holds, which actually dictate and are reflected in their actions. Hmm. And when we say beliefs, we mean beliefs about every area of life. Right. And and as you, as you dive in further, so if a worldview are the beliefs I hold that dictate my actual actions, the other aspect of worldview then is that a worldview would offer uh, a... Um, what we would call a meta narrative, an overarching story that's going to really answer. Um, most will tell you three. I like to add in a fourth, but four core questions about reality. So those four questions are: How do we get here? Question of origins: How, how do we get here? Why, why do we matter? Um, what, what's our value? Uh, what's gone wrong? Because interestingly, there's there's not there, there's only a few people that would make the claim that nothing's wrong. Uh, overwhelming majority of the world worldviews would say something's wrong. Something with the something, world. Yeah, with the world. Wrong with the world. Something's wrong with the world. Something's wrong with the world. There's mm. problems. Well, what went wrong? What is the problem? Question three is how does the problem get fixed? Mm-hmm. What's the solution to this problem? And then the fourth question that I think, as a as a believer with access to God's truth, that I think a worldview also has to address is where's it going? What's the end? Mm-hmm. Uh, where is everything headed? Even if we know how we got here, if we understand what went wrong, if we understand the solution, in light of all of that, where are we going? What's what's the end, the end goal? What's the end game? And so, a worldview is that meta narrative, that overarching story, which answers these questions. And answering these questions gives us certain beliefs. And those beliefs then are to be translated out into actions. And so, the actions that we live by reflect our beliefs, which would then tell us what our actual worldview is. Hmm. It's a way of interpreting all of life, our experiences, knowledge, truth, encounters. It's a way of interpreting a framework through which we interpret all of life. So you uh, would say we all have a worldview, regardless of, regardless of whether you're a believer or not. Everyone has a worldview. Absolutely. Nobody yeah. does not have a worldview because everybody is living life. And everybody has a framework, an interpretive lens, a pair of glasses that they see the world through. It is their worldview. Right. Where they ask those same questions, like, how did I get here? Um, What what is the problem? And then what's the solution to that problem? And, you know, I think that um, what what so many people want to know is, okay, there's a problem. And obviously I'm here, and uh, am I I part of the solution? And how, how can I... How can I be a part of that solution? And um, or may, maybe not. Maybe they, they don't ask that. But I think as believers, um, we know there's a problem. You know, we know how we got here, um, and we see the the issues in our world, and we know that we know that that um, Christ is the only one that can that can make a miracle out of this mess that we're in as a world. But and what you know? How does that play out into our life, and and how do we respond to that? And so, um, so yeah. So we all have a worldview. We all have an idea about God, the, the world, the problems in the world. So let's unpack a little bit more about. Um, so last night in the 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 first session, you helped define the worldview, uh, what the idea of what a worldview is. But then, um, where else did you go with that? Yeah, and let me before shifting there. I just remember one other aspect. One of the key differences too between a, a religion and a worldview is a religion may or may not have answers for some of those questions we've already answered. But but a religion uh, to be a worldview, there's some who would say there, there's ten categories that cover all aspects of life mm-hmm. that you have to have consistent, coherent beliefs developed in. And not every religion has answers for those 10 categories. So for instance, those 10 categories, theology, our view of God. Is there God? If so, what is he, she, it like? Mm -hmm. Uh, Philosophy, view of reality, what's real and what's true? How do we know what's real? How do we know what's true? Biology, Mm -hmm. how do we get here? Why did we get here? What's the purpose of life? Uh, 
psychology, what is the basic nature of mankind? Is man good? Is man bad? Is man indifferent? Blank slate. Uh, ethics, a view of morality, what's right? How do we know it's right? Uh, sociology, um, how should society be structured? I mean, things like family, um, uh, uh, personal relations, things like that. Law, what is the basis for law? And then closely tied politics, what is the purpose of government? Where does government come from? Economics, what produces a sound economy? History, how do we interpret uh, history if, if uh, where re most religions will fall short of a worldview is they don't address all of those categories, whereas a true worldview, so there's a Christian or a biblical worldview that has answers and addresses all of those things. We see all of those things in the first 10 chapters of Genesis. We see all mm. of those things fulfilled in the person of Christ. Uh, we find in um, in America our predominant worldviews, there's, there's the uh, biblical worldview, there's the Islamic worldview which is the fastest growing segment of the population uh, religiously, by the way, based on what I was looking at yesterday. Uh, there's the Marxist worldview. There's the secular humanist worldview, the New Age worldview, and the postmodern worldview. Mm -hmm. And all of those, uh, we were looking at stuff earlier, Matt, all of those, all of those have answers to what's the problem. Yeah. They all have their own answers on what's the problem. And, and based on what they think the problem is, they all have their own answers on what's the solution, which all inform where they think we're headed. Yeah. And so anyway, so yeah, so back to last night. Last night, essentially we did something. And I know if, if you were there last night, some of you may be asking, hey, well, man, we're really excited, but did we miss what is a biblical worldview? And I just, just a clarification, no, you didn't. I, I very intentionally <laughs> did not answer that question. In fact, that'll be next week's question. We'll walk through and unpack at least in a, in a general, broad, and concise sense, what is this thing we call a biblical worldview? Uh, last night, my aim was really this. Uh, it, it's, um, you know, right now uh, we've got, uh, you know, our little girl's 14 months old, and uh -huh. sometimes, um, sometimes my, Bethany and I, like, we're awake but I'm not really sure how alert we are, how, how really observant we are. You're going on a couple hours of sleep, and I'm awake, but my eyes are kind of... Yeah. Um, that's a lot of times how I think we are as a church community with mm -hmm. worldview. Oh, we're awake, but we're not really seeing the inconsistencies in our church life, and our personal life. We're not really... And so what last night was, was an attempt to... Um, take a bucket of ice water, toss it on all of us. So there's a little bit of a shock of going, oh, wow, now I'm awake. Now I'm alert. And, and I, I point blank told everybody, my goal last night was to uh, was to overwhelm everybody with answering the question of, well, where are we in, in, in light of this thing of worldview? And, and where we're at, we're, we're not in a good spot. Uh, all of the stats, uh, all of the stats are clear. Um and if my, of course, my computer would lock me out here and <laughs> not answer my password for several times. I want to make sure I'm accurate with what I tell you stat wise. But, you know, the stats are clear. Last night we had 100 people in the room. And based on the stats, out of that 100 people, um, if that 100 people are reflective of America, only 30 are born again, consider themselves born again believers. And out of those that consider themselves born again believers, only 10 have a biblical worldview. Mm -hmm. Or I threw out a different stat that said, based on. How many people seem to be active members in our church? If you follow the stats of how many who claim to be Christians, who claim to be born again Christians, possess a biblical worldview when tested, um, if you follow by those stats, what we concluded is in our church, if we've got 500 active church members, not, you know, we might not have 500 there on one Sunday. Some people are here this Sunday, some people are here this Sunday, sure. some are online. But if we've got 500 people who are active in our church, then based on the stats, we have 37 who possess a biblical worldview. Hmm. Now, we have 49 teachers teaching grow groups in our church. So we don't even have... If the stats are true, and, and if they were to be over us, we don't even have enough brothers and sisters in our church with a a minimum of 80%, a B-minus on biblical worldview to fulfill all of the teaching spots we have, wow. much less... Yeah. Deacon spots, or, or you know, mm -hmm. uh, greeting spots, or, or other places of service, and so, um, and and then, and as you look at those stats, if if maybe in our minds we think, well, you know, yeah, we know the younger generation's really pulling away. Well, the stats are horrible amongst my generation, the millennials. Yeah. Um, generation Z is just getting to the point where we're starting to get a pretty good amount of data, and they're becoming the focus. Um, it's not better there. But the, yeah. the real reality is this. If there's 4% of millennials who possess a biblical worldview, 
those who are older, those, you know, over the age of 60, those we would say, man, the good old days of American Christianity, only 9% of them have a biblical worldview. Wow. So all across the board, there's a great challenge. And, that, and, and so my hope last night, my prayer was that we would be so overwhelmed by it all that two things would happen. That one, it would create a desperation in how we pray. Because mm-hmm. the truth is, the only way that really we're going to see a course correction in church life is for true revival to happen where 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 the Holy Spirit, there's a movement of the Holy Spirit. And um, many times we, I, I just don't think we, we pray in, in true desperation. We realize, Lord, if you don't do something here, we, we're, we're sunk. Yeah. So part of that overwhelming was to drive us to a point of desperation. Part of it, though, is to also drive us to a point of, and it's closely tied to humility, to be willing to say, hey, you know what? Do I have? I mean, that's kind of the point I was trying to make last night is the statistics say that almost no one in this room has a biblical worldview. Are you willing then to 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 look back? Are you willing then to reconsider? Are you willing then to allow the Word of God to really wash over you in a fresh way to, to receive the Spirit's convicting and go, wow, you know what? Over here, I've really been good in my worldview, but man, look at this area over here. I've totally missed it for all my life. Mm-hmm. Man, awesome. And let's have that kind of humility to be able to receive and, and see that from the Lord. Because the truth is none of us has a flawless biblical worldview. Right. Because if we're in Christ, we're all still undergoing the process of sanctification. But we should have a, a pretty sound, pretty consistent, pretty saw. In my opinion, I think we should have at least a 90 or 95% biblical worldview based on, I think, what's clearly said in Scripture. Okay. but so And... I agree with all that. Let's let's unpack the question of why. Like, why is it so important that we have a biblical worldview, and why is it so important that we teach that to to the, the next generation, and to to make sure, um, it, it, you know, that where I'm going with that is you you've laid that out. Um, as believers, we want to have a biblical worldview, but yeah. why is it so imperative that we we communicate this? Um, this concept of a worldview. Why is it so? Why does it matter? Yeah, I, I mean, ultimately, it matters because um, Matt, a hundred times out of a hundred, you and I will do what we actually believe. Right, I mean, and that's the reality. We, we we never we always act out of what we actually believe. Now we may say we believe something mm-hmm. because it's the right answer, but that doesn't necessarily mean we actually really believe it. We actually that's what we trust. That's what our faith really is reflective of. And, and and why does it matter what we do? Because as believers, we are standing here saying that there is an almighty, all-knowing, all-loving, all-good, all-powerful God who's made us in his image. And our sin has broken us out of that relationship, mm-hmm. which is why there's the problem in the world that there is. It's why we see the brokenness. It's why we see mm-hmm. the the twistedness, the 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 backwardsness of the world. Um, and, and but praise the Lord that the solution isn't a solution we came up with. It's a solution God came up with. He sent His one and only unique Son mm-hmm. to pay the price uh, to receive the punishment we rightly deserve. Yeah. Uh, he, he lived, he, he came, he lived, he died, he rose. And there's this offer of salvation in him, but that offer of salvation is, um, I mean, I, I was, in fact, I was reading my time with the Lord the other day. Jesus walks by the Sea of Capernaum, and when he calls the first disciples, what does he say? Follow me. Mm-hmm. He doesn't say, think about me. He doesn't say, consider me. He doesn't say, feel positive about me. He doesn't right. say, write books about me. He says, follow me. Mm-hmm. Inherently, there is a doing in that, that, that there is a, a reflection. And I mean, that's what God's at work in our lives doing as believers is to conform us to the image of his son. Mm-hmm. It, it's to, it's to, it's, it's to, so why is it important we have a biblical worldview? Because if we're going to actually follow Jesus, yeah. We have to believe correctly and think rightly, but then it's imperative that we have it because what is in following Jesus? What what mission has Jesus entrusted us with with right now? This side of heaven to lead others in that to make disciples. disciples. Yeah, to make not just to make disciples, but to make disciples who will go and make disciples. Right. So we've got to be able to share the gospel message. We've got to be able to see people come to faith in Christ in mm-hmm. response to the Lord, and then when they come to faith in Christ, we've got to pour into them so that they can then go and, and be part of doing the same. Well, how on earth can we get there if, how can we make disciples when we're not walking as a disciple? Yeah. And, 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 and we will, here's the other reality. All of us make disciples, and we tend to make disciples of ourselves. Yeah. So if I am not a f- really following as a disciple of Christ, 
and I go try to make a disciple of someone, who who are they gonna who are they gonna be like? Right. They're, they're gonna look like me. But if I'm walking with Christ and I'm and I'm reflecting Christ, and if I'm discipling someone, they're gonna look like Christ because I'm, I'm 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 discipling to that end. And then the other aspect of that is not it, or it's burrowing down into discipleship. Is there's clearly in Scripture this call? Every generation has a generation behind it that there is a clear call in Scripture to pass along the faith to. Mm. Yeah. And so part of the reason I think we see that things are so bad in the younger generations is because if we're honest, and we're going to go there in two weeks on Wednesday night, just a little plug for everybody watching, how do we get to where we're at today? If we're honest, though there was a time when culturally the morals of Scripture were more honored than they are today, yeah. if we are honest, the reason there's such a lack of biblical worldview in the younger generations today is because there was a lack of biblical worldview in the generations that came before them. Mm. Yeah. And if we don't correct this, we will continually repeat the same cycle. It's just like the book of Judges. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think um, you made a comment earlier about how we're all disciples. And I mean, those of us that are, are following Jesus Christ, um, we, we are influenced by a lot of yeah. A lot of teaching from culture, from from government, from other people, and um, yeah, we say we follow Christ, but what happens is these ideas creep in from all these other sources, and it begins to begins to pollute um, the the purity of Christ and and yeah. and what we what we are to believe, and so um, especially with culture. I mean, that's yeah. just, that's just one, sure. but um, you know, we we so we come to church, you know, once or twice a week, but. We live in the culture the rest of the week, and and we're we're bombarded with images, and and um, you know we we tend to gravitate towards those who are celebrities or those yeah. who uh, you know give us give us these messages, and we're like, oh, I like that, and we begin to create kind of our own way of thinking and our own ideas about God, where we may we may. Had no scripture and read scripture, but we're like, you know, but that that sounds good, or I, I like that too, or yeah. and we and we before we know it, we've created this whole different kind of Christianity, yeah. and uh, our, we, we call that syncretism, yeah, uh, yeah, which is actually the and we looked at last night that is actually the dominant worldview. Eighty eight percent of Americans don't actually fall in any category of worldview. Yeah, they're syncretists. Yeah. Or someone described to me as a like a cafeteria plan, yeah. where it's like that looks good, that looks good. Yeah. Okay, you know, I'll, t- I'll take this from the Marxist line. I'll take a couple of these from the biblical yeah. line. I'll take some of this from the oh, well, I like a lot of the secular line. That's right. really good. That's a lot of good sugar. Makes me feel good. You know, like that's yeah, that's totally what we do. <laughs> yeah, and so then we then we try to pass that to our kids, but also realizing that our kids and then the younger generation, I mean, they're also in taking all of this. Um, you had mentioned a, a TikTok pastor last night and just, you know, influences like TikTok where, you know, people will will gravitate towards that and you got just so much craziness on, on TikTok, well, and right? I think, and I think that's the reason stuff is all of a sudden seemingly moving at warp speed. Yeah. You know, is, is and, I, and, and I'm, I'm by no means, I, I'm not a, I don't love social media, but I'm not like, social media is a thing. It's not inherently a right or wrong. It's, right. it's a thing. How it's used, how it's viewed, how it's consumed, that's the, where the right or wrong comes in. And, you know, that's where things have changed. I, I even think about, I think about, in the, you know, the last year and a half in America, we, we have all of a sudden we've got an explosion of worldview terms mm-hmm. that no one had ever heard before. We've got things like CRT and intersectionality. We've yeah. got, um, you know, people tossing out woke theology is woke good is woke bad. We've got, you know, that's in one vein. We've got, we've, we've been seeing in the last decade so many drives of, of the feminist movement or, or of this movement, that movement. And, and here's what's crazy is um, no one's saying the term liberation theology, but all of those movements come back and, and have ties into. I finished college 11 years ago. I went to a Christian university. We talked about all sorts of ridiculous theological things all the time. It's, you know, there's, there, that stereotype wasn't everywhere, but it was true. Yeah, there, there was some of that there. Ten years ago, I wasn't talking to anybody 
who was bringing up those things. Because for you to go as a college student and really dive into that, you were going to have to go to a library and pull um, from some really um, liberal theologians. That just it wasn't common for consumption. Fast forward to the last couple of years of college ministry for me. I mean, if you go through my Instagram, you would find safe posts and go, wow, our pastor's a heretic because I save a lot of stuff I see pop up from other students so I can be aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason it's going so fast is because we found we, we, there's those out there who have found a way to take what was once heavily academic and elite and in locked in certain places, mm -hmm. and they've made it palatable for the everyday public, and they are pumping it nonstop on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube, yeah. where now yeah. anybody... I mean, you think about that. If you give your kid an iPhone at 10 years old and they've got an Instagram account, all of these theologians, all of these movements, all of these twists on truth, yeah. they have access to. Right. Whereas once they might have lived their whole life 40 years ago and never even heard of any right. of it. Yeah. So a part of why I think it's moving so fast is because the 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 means through which we can get information, information has become yeah. far more accessible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, I know we're going to continue to unpack this in the weeks to come, but here, here's where I want to end with this, Wes, um, this question to you. Um, let's look at the, let's look at the source of all this. I mean, how have we gotten to where we are? I mean, obviously we talked about the problem being sin, but sure. let's talk about the bigger battle. I mean, Let's yeah, I mean, that. I think Scripture is super clear. When you look at Scripture, you know, it's, it's some. How, how did we get here? Well, I think it's easy for us to go, man. Cu well, culture's just gotten so bad, man. Culture's just gotten so bad. The world's just such. Here's the reality: the world's no more wicked today than it was a hundred years ago. It's no more wicked today than it was in Jesus. Like the world's broken. It's wicked. Like Scripture, <laughs> Scripture doesn't yeah. qualify. Well, in this season, the world's a little <laughs> less like it. it this, the world's broken. Yeah. Period. The reality is Scripture is clear in Ephesians 6. Our battle as believers yeah. is not, not against, against flesh, flesh and yeah. blood. And it's therefore not against culture. It's mm -hmm. against powers and principalities mm -hmm. and forces of darkness. Scripture is clear. That there is a real being uh, that we call Satan. Yeah. Scripture is clear that there is a, a legion of, of demonic armies, of demons that are in cahoots with him. Mm -hmm. Um and that's who, I mean, Scripture, First, uh, Second Corinthians 4 talks about that over those who are non-believers, that Satan has put a veil oh, over yeah. their hearts to prevent them from understanding. Um, uh, we, we look at Ephesians 2, the prince of the power of the air, the reality that behind, who's really behind culture? Mm -hmm. Demonic influence. Yeah. Now, I think in our society, we hear demons and spiritual warfare, and we either run to like the exorcist, or we think of those Looney Tune cartoons where it's like mm -hmm. devil with the pitchfork. <laughs> right. and, it's much more, much more subtle, yeah. But the reality is, I firmly believe the overwhelming majority of yeah spiritual warfare, Paul sums up in 1 Corinthians 10, where he says, we have not been given uh, physical weapons, we've been given um, spiritual weapons that, that, are, that are powerful for the mm. destruction of strongholds, the tearing down of fortresses, which just, by the way, ought to be a huge encouragement in this discussion about worldview. It means that as believers, we have been given weapons that are strong enough to tear down the palaces of false worldview. Right. But then he goes into defines what are those weapons, and he says, taking captive every thought to the obedience Making of obedience, Christ. Yeah. So what is ultimately spiritual warfare? It's taking captive our thoughts. Yeah. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit and the self-control of the Spirit produced within us to take captive our thoughts to the obedience of Christ, which what does that mean to take captive the obedience of Christ? It means take captive our thoughts to the Word of God. Right. To the Word of God. And so it's not... It's not what do I feel about this. It's wait a minute. Is that thought true or not? Right. <laughs> it's it's very honestly. It's very unglamorous, and it wouldn't make a great movie. Which is why I think we fell at it a lot as Americans, because mm -hmm. we're real wrapped up in what we feel and, and and what's glamorous and what seems cool and heroic and this and that, and and we struggle with just everyday mundane things. And so it's why we allow. I love. I think it was Martin Luther who made a quote, something along the lines of, "I can't control." My, I can't control what thoughts come into my mind any more than I can control the birds that fly through the sky. But I can absolutely control which birds get to nest in my tree. Mm. That's good. Thoughts are going to come at us from all sorts of places. Yeah. And I said last night, my students over the years have heard me say it, 99.9% .9 truth is 100% a lie 100% of the time. Yeah. 
And Satan is a master in these thoughts. Look at Scripture. Yeah. How'd Satan tempt Adam and Eve with the Word of God? Right. I mean, what God had said. How did Satan tempt Jesus? By quoting scripture. Right. By quoting scripture. How do you think Satan's going to try to mess with us in, in this battle of worldviews to present something that sounds and maybe has a connection right. or two to truth, but also isn't fully surrendered to truth and takes you another way? And so, I mean, yeah, it's a subtle, powerful battle. Right. And we talk about our truth or my truth, yep. and there really is only one truth, and that's the Word of God. Absolutely. And, and that's why it's so important and that we've been given that as, as, our, as our weapon. You know, when you look at the, the, um, the spiritual armor, you know, how everything else yep. is, is used to, for defense, but then yep. our offense is the Word of God. And that's why it's important to know it and to live by it. Good stuff, man. I, I'm I'm excited about this, and uh, no, I'm I'm pumped for the days it. ahead. Excited for th- things the Lord's going to let us get to go through as a church body, and and for, for us to sure. un- unpack it uh, more and more each week uh, here on the podcast. Yeah, me too. Me too. So, well, Pastor West, would you pray us out? Yeah. today? Father, I do just ask uh, for those listening, for church family, as, as we walk through this, Lord, just that you would, I think of Jesus, your prayer in John 17, you pray, Father, sanctify them in truth, and then you say, your word is truth. Mm. So, Father, may our lives be captive to your word, and may you set us apart, set us clean, make us pure, shine us bright in your word. Um, God, may we take captive our thoughts to the obedience of Christ, and... Um, Jesus, we just look to you. This is not a battle we can win on our own, but oh, praise the Lord. Uh, you are with us and you are for us Absolutely. in this battle. So Jesus, it's just in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor West, thank you. Absolutely. And thank you guys for tuning in. And uh, man, be sure to share this. Hit the like button there. Um, you can find us on all the different platforms out there. What's what's your favorite? What's your favorite platform? Uh, I'll be honest, I don't know. Really okay. Well, I, I, you know, I can... Spotify, iHeartRadio. Um, whatever you got apple hey we're just grateful that you listen and we are grateful when you share so get the word out thanks for listening